Okay, hi, how you doing? I realize I'm the last person before lunch, so uh, I'm not? Oh, never mind then, excuse me. Uh, but I do have less cats and rabbits in this, so uh, hopefully I'll be able to match Denise's gusto. Uh, so I'm Damon Edwards. Uh, this talk is about what goes wrong in operations and what gets in the way and what we can, can do about it. Uh, I think why I'm standing here, um, Gene Kim, the author of The Phoenix Project, calls me like an accidental uh, DevOps analyst. Um, through my career, I uh, was a managing uh, director uh, or managing partner of a company called DTO Solutions. We used to do a lot of operations improvement and DevOps uh, improvement uh, consulting. And uh, currently, I'm a co-founder of RunDeck. Uh, we make operations tools. Also do a lot of work in the DevOps community. Um, so you know, I've, I've gotten to see inside a lot of companies, right? Big ones, small ones, high flyers, not so high flyers. And that's kind of formed the, uh, the worldview, which I'm going to talk about today. Um, I think fundamentally, developers have had this unfair advantage uh, when it comes to uh, the life, I guess. <laughs> uh, if you think about you know, sort of the dev and ops divide, on the dev side, we've had this thing called agile. It's been seeping into everyone's brains uh, for about, I guess, about 17 years now, right? And whether or not you were doing agile, it was in the tools, it was in the books, it was in the conference speeches, all these ideas of lean and going faster uh, were there. If you think about the operations side of the house, the last great sort of a <laughs> Innovation was ITIL in 1989, right? So, um, you know, that's, uh, it's a different time frame and a different, different mindset. So on one side where it's been go, 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 you kind of peer through that uh, post-deployment curtain and it's like we're back in 2005, right? Everything's very siloed and a lot of tickets and things break too often and cost too much and take too long. So this story is about kind of why that's happening and what we're going to do about that because the only way we're really going to get these full force DevOps transformation is if we get the entire organization uh, uh, behind this. And uh, you know, my point of view, going back to that slide of who I am, is generally comes from the enterprise, right? I work with a lot of large scale companies um, where you know, they've got lots of systems, uh, lots of people, lots of tools, processes that have, that have been acquired over multiple decades in many cases, and it all has to hang to, uh, together. So, I want to start with the story. Uh, this is a true story. The um, names have been uh, changed to protect the, uh, the not so innocent, but uh, this all really happened. So it starts with this company. Uh, we'll uh, remain anonymous. Uh, they talk a lot outwardly about their change, right? Um, they're trying really hard. They're putting a lot of effort uh, behind this. They've got digital. They've got agile. They've got you know DevOps. Their DevOps transformation. They got these new SRE teams they're spinning up on the technology side. They got cloud. They got Docker, Kubernetes, microservice. It's super cool looking, right? And they give great conference speeches about about all of this, and they're trying really, really hard. Um, but what nobody was talking about is what happened after deployment, right? So let's tell a story about that, right? <laughs> Could imagine your minds. It's just another Tuesday, right? It's 9 a.m. Uh, some alarms start going off in the knock, right? And they're like, yeah, haven't we been seeing some issues like this this week? And the other folks, I'm like, yeah, I'm not really sure, maybe. Next thing you know, you know, phone rings. It's a business manager. Evidently, they're running well. That they're on the phone, um, saying this is a, this is a problem, customer problem. Uh, we gotta we gotta escalate, right? So the knock opens a ticket. That of course sets off the great alarm. Um, all the app specific SREs get on the uh, uh, on the bridge call, and uh, they start into their try this, then try that uh, you know, way of trying to figure out what is going on. Now, of course, uh, we don't trust these people, right? So we only have a certain set of systems administrators who have access to certain privileged uh, systems that have customer data on them. So on the bridge call, there's a lot of, hey, do you try this? Hey, do you try that? Of course, the business manager, right? And they're pretty smart. That's how they got to their position. They found their way onto the bridge call, right? And they're, are you done yet? Are you done with What's happening? And finally, uh, somebody says, ah, got it. I think there's a problem with the Foo service, right? So like, ah, can you fix it? And then the Foo SRE is like, well, no, this is a brand new version. I'm not really sure how this what's going on here, this all seems new, we've switched to this new container infrastructure, uh, so I'm not quite sure, right? So uh, they said, okay, well, let's escalate this to our lead developer, Karen, right? Uh, so Karen, you know, she's in the last kind of, uh, 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 um, the sort of the tail end of her sprint here, she's locked in, she's got her headphones on, her herbal tea, she sits in the new cool floor, it's got all the open, open floor plan, she's just coding away, ignoring her emails, ignoring her phone, right? And finally, manager knocks on the door. Is like, hey, you know, Karen, did you did you see this ticket? She's like, oh, okay, God, I'll, go, I'll go take a look at it, right? And if you notice down below here, this is the uh, I call this the context wagon. So, right, when you're working in a ticket system, it's the idea that uh, you know once the ticket starts opening, you start adding more people to it. And even if you're not directly involved, it's just in your inbox. It's always there, right? And you just kind of in this piece of your brain somewhere where you're you're part of this adventure. You're in the wagon. You're going along for it, right? 
And so Karen's like, okay, well, I'm going to need more log files, right? Puts us into the ticket. Of course, she knows that's going to take too long. So she knows the, the hip chat where uh, the other systems administrators hang out and says, hey, can someone help me with this ticket? Or I need some logs, right? So Lee, being very you know, helpful, uh, he pops up and says, hey, Karen, here's the logs, right? How many think they're the right logs in the first time? Yeah, none, none, right? So they go around and around with a no, not, not that, I know I need this, maybe I need that, right? Until finally, uh, you know, Karen, it's about two o'clock in the afternoon by now, right? We started this at, you know, 9 a.m., right? Karen goes, ah, who restarted these, these services, right? All these containers are restarted wrong, right? Uh, there wasn't the correct environment variables. This entire service pool needs to be restarted. We're probably going to see some cascading failures here. So our incident manager, Bob, not that Bob, different Bob, uh, <laughs> updates the ticket and says, hey, middleware, can we please restart these, uh, sir, these, the entire app pool, right? All these containers. And of course, they gave the containers to the middleware team because that's, you know, it just sort of made logical sense, I guess, to somebody. And uh, so now it's 2.30 and they say, whoa, you know, Melissa, the middleware manager, picks up the phone, says, no way, it's the middle of the day, you need business approval to, uh, to do this restart, right? So the Bob then escalates it up to the, SVP for the line of the whole business, right? Because bad things have happened before, so we decided that Karen uh, had, to be, uh, had to be called in. And Karen had her chief of staff call all the other VPs, right? And say, is this risky? Is this dangerous, right? Ah, it's just a restart, right? How, you know, and it's, it should be okay. Uh, now, mind you, these SVP, or these, you know, VPs haven't been near the keyboard other than email in a long time, but they're like, well, it's a restart, and it's a web service, it should be good, right? So ding, restart, approved. Now our, our context wagon's getting fuller and fuller, right? Everybody's getting, getting uh, pulled into this. And it's now five o'clock at night, right? And so it goes back to the middleware manager who says, well, hmm, you know, who knows this service is best, right? Everyone says, oh, that's Ellen. Or is Ellen? Oh, she's left her at the airport. We put her on the plane to the new European office for our, our new service launch. It's like, oh, okay, well, you know, who knows, right? Who knows is best? So the second in is Scott. Scott's pretty new, only a few months old. And he goes, oh boy, okay, well, yeah, I think I can, I can give this a shot. So Scott, Scott goes dumpster diving, right, through the SharePoint, through the, the different wikis, trying to kind of get a handle on all these things. And uh, finally goes, okay, feel pretty good about this. Notice our context wagon's getting bigger and bigger, right, sort of uh, on the stage here. So he starts going through things, and it's looking pretty good. Except there's one thing called bar service, right? Keeps saying, waiting for Acme service, right? And he's like, hmm, well, what's that? Ten minutes later, it says, Acme startup failed. He's like, oh boy. This is not good, right? You know, why is this happening? Come on, come on, come on. Suddenly, it's like the heat came on. It was really, it was really, uh, <laughs> it was really weird, right? And so, uh, he's just like, come on, I'm the new guy, not me, right? So, he up updates the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to jump backwards there. So, he updates the ticket, right, and says, hey, look, the bar app startup is timed out. Uh, the error says, I can't connect to the Acme service. I looked at the Acme service. I can't, it seems to be running. What's going on here, right? He, so, he adds the bar SRE. Uh, the bar SE comes on and says, oh, this is the new uh, DevOps-inspired pre-flight check, uh, checkup, right, where uh, we make sure that this service starts up. It has this pre-flight check. And it looks like bar is trying to connect to Acme, and that's being, that's being blocked. And they're like, well, what are we going to do about this right now? Context wagon getting even bigger. Uh, we say, okay, well, let's, um, let's try two things here. Let's add the network SRE team and this, the bar lead dev onto this. Uh, first person to answer was our bar lead dev, and they said, well, I can comment out this test. No problem. Uh, but our CD pipeline only goes to QA. Then we got to call the change management team to get it into production and go, okay, forget that. That's not gonna, that's not gonna work. Let's try the network route, right? Meanwhile, a little interlude here, uh, the business managers start calling the middleware manager as to what the heck's going on here. Uh, you know, why are, why are customers are calling? What's happening? And Melissa, in an epic bout of finger pointing, says, you know, it's the network, right? So then the network team uh, says, hey, no problem. We're already working on this. This is the VP, right? So we're already working on this. And they're calling their team saying, you guys stay on this, this network outage until it's done. Lo and behold to them, there actually is a real network outage in the company. So everybody is focused on that outage, and nobody wants to answer the call from the people doing this other restart problem, right? So now, luckily, Scott, uh, when he's, he's a new person, had some beers with uh, and part, of the, part of the new hire program with a network director named Carlos. Uh, and he had a cell phone number and said, Carlos, can you help us here? Can you escalate this? Um, so finally, uh, Harry, the, one of the network SREs, um, comes on, says, yep, firewall is uh, blocking the traffic, and uh, you're going to take it up with the firewall team, right? So now urgent firewall request goes, uh, ticket goes out, right? Context wagons getting deeper and deeper. It's 8 o'clock at night, right? Uh, this started at 9 a.m., right? Uh, Freddie, the firewall engineer, comes on and says, hey, this can't be, 
a firewall uh, rule problem. It's Tuesday. We haven't changed rules since last Thursday. Uh, Scott says, no, this is a, this is a firewall problem. Uh, we, just, we just try to do a restart. It's the first time I would have connected. And so Freddie goes and looks and says, ah, yes. You know, last Thursday, we changed a firewall rule uh, that would stop Barr from talking to Acme because someone said Barr no longer had to talk to Acme. Uh, so he says, well, can you change it back? And of course, Freddie says, well, sure, on Thursday, if you fill out the right form. And so everyone's like, no, wait, we've got to do this now. This is an emergency, right? So Freddie updates, says, says um, you know, uh, urgent escalation, I uh, have to do this emergency firewall rule change. So Nicole from NetSec pops in and says, ah, this is a production change, right? Three out of five people from the cab group must, must approve this change. And everyone's like, come on, you know? And then finally, uh, the chief of staff, um, Scott, says, has the magic password, which is, I'll call Susan, the SPP, right? And ding, firewall rule change is, uh, is approved, right? And so uh, it's now 9.30 at night. Context wagon's getting huger and huger. They finally do this, you know, go through their trial and error. They take out the firewall rule. They, you know, get things going, and things get started again, right? They think, right? And everyone's like, well, what do you mean you think? It's like, well, well they don't really trust us SREs to actually see if anything's actually uh, fixed. They actually have to have the customer engagement team test all the APIs for the customers to see if things are actually working. They won't give us the tools to, to do that. Uh, so we had Paige Varsha, the customer engagement manager. It's 11 o'clock at night. It's Varsha's birthday, true story. And she was out with her friends. She came home early, ran the different tests, uh, said, yes, services restarts all looked good. Customers are happy. It's 11.30 at night. People are finally going to bed. And you know the, we can finally close our, our ticket, right? And then the very next morning, of course, right? Susan, the SVP, gathers everybody and says, whose fault is this, right? Why are we so bad at change? What additional processes and approvals are, can we add so this will never happen again, right? <laughs> Does that sound familiar to anybody? Anybody live in this, <laughs> in this world? Yeah. So, you know, later on, like, this magic realization happens, right? The executive team says, come on now, we invested in DevOps and Agile and the cloud, containers, right? Kubernetes, you know, everything still takes too long and costs too much, right? You know, why is that? And somebody sheepishly kind of brings up that, you know, we've never really looked at operations in this transformation. We've been so fixated on delivery and deployment and go, 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 we've never actually thought about the rest of life, right? So, you know, what ends up happening here is most companies really end up chasing the symptoms, right? So they look at all this and they go, oh, we got to chase all these problems and try to solve all these problems individually. And they usually use this combination of, um, of, uh, of ideas, right? So the first one is, you know, we need better tools, right? Because remember, you know, Kubernetes is going to solve it today, Ansible is going to solve it yesterday, Chef before that, Puppet before that, Blade Logic, right? The next tool is always going to solve this problem, right? But it never does. We need more people, right? This is just a non-starter, right? If anybody knows today's age, we need, we need more people, but we need more people doing more things. We can't just throw more bodies at these problems. Even if we had the budget for it, we couldn't find them, right? Um, this one is probably my favorite, which is we need more discipline and attention to details. So we'll stop making operational mistakes, right? I mean, that's like telling developers, stop coding bugs, right? You're not, you're not, you're not, you're not paying attention hard enough, right? And then we need more change reviews and approvals, right? Because that didn't, you know, we're just not, doing that, that, process, uh, that process hard enough. So we need another process to watch to make sure we did the previous process that didn't work uh, either. So you know, we really have to kind of forget about these and really ch challenge the conventional wisdom about operations work and how it, um, how it happens, right? So there's these four forces. We want to kind of break it down and say, you know, what undermines this operations work? What causes that tale of woe that we just went through? There's really these four, I call them the, the, the four uh, horsemen of the operations apocalypse, right? It's silos, ticket queues, uh, toil, excessive toil, really, and low trust, right? I'm going to go through each of those for you and talk about what we're going to do about them. So silos. So people you toss the word silo around, right? And often it's kind of become synonymous with, with teams. And so to get rid of silos, get rid, get rid of teams. That's not really the case. Silos are really just a, a way of working, right? You can have different teams, but they don't have to necessarily be working in a silo. When you're working in a silo, if you imagine like you're working by yourself, right? Or with a very small team. You have a common backlog, you know, a common manager driving it. You have a common context or information set that you're working with. You see the world the same way. You have a common set of use the tools in the same way. Um, and you have a kind of common set of priorities. But the problem is nothing lives in, in, in isolation, right? Especially in an enterprise. So you always need something from somebody else, right? And that's when the silo behaviors start to come in because somebody else does something that you need or vice versa, and they have their own context, their own backlog, their own priorities, their own way of using, using their tools and seeing the world. 
And that's where these disconnects start to, to happen. And what happens is we're working in different contexts, different, uh, different types of processes, our tooling doesn't really quite line up, and our capacity often doesn't line up, right? We have, you know, like a DBA team, and we have, you know, of 20 and, you know, 3,000 developers, right? I mean, there's, there is that kind of capacity mismatch uh, in, these, in these organizations. And all these disconnects kind of cause you to turn inward because you worry about your silo and doing your job and you're optimizing for that and not really not realizing that by optimizing for that, you're just creating more of these disconnects and, uh, and mismatches. And, you know, number one, silos interfere with feedback loops, right? I don't know if anyone's read the Phoenix Project or uh, the DevOps Handbook. It talks a lot about the three ways of DevOps, right? It's improving flow, um, building feedback loops, and then continuously improving and tightening those those feedback loops. And these silos and those disconnects get in the way of these feedback loops, which means it gets in the way of learning, it gets in the way of quality improvement. Um, you know, um, bad things happen when you break up these feedback loops in an end-to-end -end, um, uh, process. And this is not just dev and ops, right? If you think about it from an environment team to a network team or to a database team, even within operations, there's consumers and producers all over the place. And when you act in silos and kind of divide things up in these functional groups, uh, these silo effects take hold, and these feedback loops get, uh, get broken. So it really happens everywhere. So that brings us to the second thing, which is ticket queues, right? Who loves ticket queues, by the way? Opening tickets, closing tickets, right? Everybody? No? Bob? Bob does. Okay. <laughs> it's always one. <laughs> Wise guy. So what do we do, right? So I talked about silos, and we got these disconnects and mismatches. So we've brought this beautiful thing called a ticket queue right in the middle, right? And that's gonna solve our problems. But we all know how well that works, right? We get these where I'm waiting for something, I gotta get a product, man project manager to push somebody to do it, and then I get it back and it's not quite right, or I didn't know how to ask the question, I'm not a firewall engineer, but I'm typing in a blank box here trying to tell them what I, what I need. Um, and so, you know, we get these, these disconnects and, um, you know, it's really not, not surprising. Uh, because while we kind of think of queues as these saviors, like, oh, you should get your JIRA, your service now, and just put a queue wherever, wherever you need something done. If you look at what came out of the manufacturing, um, you know, uh, math, <laughs> physics, uh, things like queuing theory, um, you know, queues are actually quite expensive, right? Uh, there's a guy who wrote a great book, Don Reinertsen, um, called The Principles of Product Development Flow, um, that really kind of breaks down, um, it's a great book, it really breaks down sort of why queues are expensive, why working in large batches is expensive, all the kind of stuff we talk about in the DevOps conversations. He really gets into it. But his main point is that queues create, you know, longer cycle time, right? It just takes longer to get things done or putting a queue in the way. Increased risk, because we know that longer things, things go, the more risk there is. The breaks in context cause more risks. More variability, right? You get a lot of one-offs in answering these, these queues. Uh, more overhead, we have to manage these things, right? And all the process and the project managers and escalations and whatnot. Uh, we have lower quality because of all of those things. And interesting enough, lower motivation. The longer people have to wait, the longer the work you do sits in a queue for you know, going somewhere else, the less detached, or the more detached we become and the less uh, motivated we, we become. So queues are very expensive, yet it's the thing we drop into, into, into the middle of our organization. And then also in the whole DevOps conversation, we talk a lot about value streams, right? Seeing the end-to-end -end system, systems thinking, right? But what, if, what do these queues do, right? They take that holistic picture that we work so hard to build, and now we have these different queues where work has to go, and we're just blowing that picture up, right? And everyone's seeing these little pieces of it, and we're disintegrating and obfuscating these value streams and these the systems views that we've been working so hard to, uh, to build. So of course, you know, bad things are gonna happen. And queues become these snowflake makers, right? Where, you know, snowflake's a fun little term that means, you know, it might be technically uh, correct at that moment, it might be a beautiful thing, right? But it's totally, like a snowflake, it's totally unread, un, an unreproducible and brittle one-off, right? Um, so and this is what happens when you're kind of working behind these queues is you get something, you parachute in, ah, here I am, I'm gonna help solve this problem, I move on to the next thing, I move on to the next thing, and you end up creating a lot of you know, technically, technically correct one-offs, and these become very dangerous for not only the next person comes along, things are a little bit different, it becomes very difficult to automate things, right? Because only worse than automation that's broken is automation that's just a little bit wrong, right? You know, it's, uh, it's bad. And then you, then you get these functional labor pools. So people in, working inside these silos, working behind these ticket queues, uh, you end up with all these one-offs. These requests are fulfilled by these semi-manual or, or um, 
uh, a manual effort, lots of snowflakes, lots of bottlenecks for all the requests coming in. And then the primary management focus becomes about protecting that team's capacity, stopping them from being overrun, right? This is where the whole operations VP of no uh, comes in. We found that it's as much about this as it is about the, the, the risk factor, right? You see, oh, well, ops always says no because they're afraid of, of change. Often it's they're trying to protect the capacity uh, just as much as they're afraid of, of, uh, of change. So this stuff really builds up, right? And then toil, right? So toil is really the enemy of, of, of so much of, of operations work. Uh, is anybody familiar with the SRE movement? Right there, yeah, everybody? Good, okay. So how about toil? Familiar with toil, maybe, see people? Okay, enough, well, I'll, I'll explain it still, but. Um, so toil, uh, this is Vivek Rao at Google has this great definition for it. He says, toil is the kind of work that's tied to running a production service that tends to be manual, repetitive, Automatable, like you should have, could have automated it. Tactical, devoid of enduring value, which is a key part. And it scales linearly as the service grows, right? So it's, it's the work we have to do that's not really, it's not adding enduring value to the company. We should have automated it, but it's still eating up our, our time. It may be necessary. I mean, maybe because the way the world is today, you have to do this work, otherwise, you know, everything falls down. Um, but it should be viewed as something a little bit uh, icky, right? Like, I don't want to be doing that anymore. And you compare that to engineering work, right? Um, which is using human creativity and capacity to do, uh, to, to, to add enduring value. So, uh, you know, toil is about lacks enduring value. It's kind of in the moment we have to do it. Engineering work builds enduring value. Toil is often rote and repetitive. Engineering work is that creative and iterative. Um, toil feels very tactical. Uh, and engineering work is about strategic and making tomorrow better than it is today. Um, toil, uh, key characteristic, it increases with scale. You know, if we scale to a billion users, we're going to have to have to scale linearly our, uh, um, these folks along with it to, uh, to do all this toil. And, uh, you know, whereas engineering work enables scaling with the team we have today. And toil can be automated, and engineering work is really what requires human creativity um, to, to do it. And why this is so important is that uh, you want to keep that toil at a manageable uh, percentage of capacity because toil, engineering work is good for two things. One is for improving the business, right, adding that enduring value. And the second is for reducing toil. And this is actually one of the most important parts because if you don't have that capacity to reduce that toil, you basically get overrun, right? And you end up with this engineering bankruptcy where you don't have time to um, improve the business and you're helpless because you have no capacity to even fight back and push back against all of that, all of that um, all of that toil. So excessive toil prevents us from improving uh, today to make tomorrow better, and it also um, prevents us from improving the business. It turns us into this kind of dehumanizing operations work that really doesn't, doesn't help uh, anybody as we're toiling away in the uh, digital salt mine, so to speak. So we talked about silos, queues, toil. The last one is low trust. This really also undermines what we're trying to do. If you think about it, you know, where are decisions made, right? Who can take this action, right? You think about it, you know, people over here closest to the problem, they have all the context. Yet, if you think about organizations, so much of it is about the highest paid person in the room, right? How do we escalate things up until somebody can make, a, can make a decision about a problem or something that they're seeing on the, on the front line? And um, John Alspa, that's John there, he, uh, he had this great uh, talk at the DevOps Enterprise Summit in San Francisco last year, and he did this thing where he showed this to people and he says, who thinks this is dangerous, right? I know some of you just kind of puckered up a little bit with that, <laughs> right? And he's like, yeah, but what if it's just this uh, command that we run on, this, con on this, uh, this content cache to clear it out every once in a while? You know, not so, not so dangerous, right? Then he goes, what about this, right? Who thinks, who thinks this is dangerous, right? And you're like, oh yeah, just change the little case and, you know, between this uh, little status message here. And he goes, but what if I told you it was a health check for a load balancer? Right? Suddenly, it's a little dangerous, right? And his main point is that it always, the answer is always it depends, especially when you're talking about complex systems, distributed systems, all the things that Denise was, was talking about. In this world that we live in, the answer is always depends. So if these are the people that have the context, how is it that we're relying on these people, God bless them, to you know, make the decisions for what we're trying to do? So this is the hallmark of a low trust organization, is how much of the decision making has to be escalated up versus how much decision making is made as closest to the problem um, as possible. How much trust is given and how much empowerment is given to those people in that part of the, uh, the organization. So those are the four horsemen of the uh, DevOps, uh, or I guess operations apocalypse, I should, <laughs> I should say. Um, so let's go on here. So what are we gonna do about this, right? What can we do differently to try to get rid of these, uh, these forces? Because we can't solve these forces, we're always gonna be chasing the symptoms that they, they cause. 
So the first one, the obvious one, is get rid of as many silos as possible, right? So we think about um, kind of our old way of thinking. We organize our organizations. Everything was sort of functionally, um, these kind of vertical functional uh, groupings. Um, you know, what if we can think about the work actually flows horizontally, right? So what if we can think about how do we put these functions together so we don't have these breaks in context? We don't have these handoffs um, as our work progresses from the aha to the, you know, ka-ching at, uh, at the end. Um, and the key here is not everybody do everything. Right? I think this has been kind of misconstrued as like, oh, we must have full stack everybody who can do everything. The reality is, is about a shared responsibility, right? That we have people who have a shared responsibility for a service from beginning to, uh, to end. Not everybody does everything. If you think about it, the organizational model really isn't as important as how the teams act. So um, let me cartoonishly talk about the uh, Netflix model and a Google model. So anybody here from Netflix or Google, forgive me for, uh, uh, for cartoonizing it. But if you think about it, Netflix talks a lot about there is no dev and ops, right? Everything is about teams that are empowered to build and run their own services, right? It's all about they're going to put people in the same teams, in the same groups, and they're all going to collaborate and, and const have them cradle to grave, own the full life cycle of those services. And then you talk about the Google model, right? If you read the SRE books, uh, they have a dev and an ops divide, right? But they have clear handoff requirements coming from development towards uh, operations, SRE, right? And they have these air budget driven consequences that, that push things back from SRE towards development. So, you know, what they're doing is they have the same high velocity, high quality results, but in totally different organizational models and philosophies. And they do that through this concept of shared responsibility. You know, one model does it by shared responsibility, you're all on the same team. The other model does it by these different uh, management um, tricks that they've got um, that uh, is about, you know, creating that shared responsibility across what would be, what would be organizational boundaries, which would kind of destroy other, other organizations. And then, um, you know, what about the cross-cutting concerns, right? So it's like, we got all these things we need to do, we can't put them all on these teams. So we're just gonna throw a bunch of ticket queues there, right? And then we got these different teams need to talk to each other, so we throw more ticket queues and we're all right back to where we, where we started before, right? So um, there's a design pattern that we've been seeing kind of happening across these high velocity organizations. And uh, we, my fellow colleagues at Rundeck, we call it operations of service or self-service operations, we're kind of trying out different names. But it's a pattern that we've seen occur over and over again, which is a focus on building platforms um, that enable pull-based operation services, right? So anything you would need from those specialists, from changing routine firewall rules to routine schema changes to new environments to doing restarts in production to doing health checks, everything that, that these teams would do to build and operate their services, they're being turned into pull-based um, on-demand services that be, can be consumed as needed uh, by these, these individual teams. And uh, they take it one step further. It's not just giving people a button, but it's also giving people the ability to define those procedures as well. So as part of a high velocity organization, the developers are writing their own operational procedures, passing them off to, uh, to, to, to the production teams who are then looking at them, doing code reviews, security reviews, and saying, yep, those look good. And then using this operations as service type uh, facility to give control back to, to those teams in some business lines, other business lines having a central sort of SRE or you know, kind of knock organization to take care of things. Um, but the idea being that operations still has full control and all the goodness of what they have always done, but they're giving control, right? They're staying out of the way of these other teams trying to, trying to deliver things, replacing those ticket queues with pull-based self-services wherever possible, and the tickets only remain for kind of special, uh, special reasons. And it works in any org model, right? It works in that sort of cross-functional team model, works in the sort of SRE kind of separate operations organization model, model, uh, doesn't really matter. And there's these kind of popular use cases that you see, um, you know, it's like things like, oh, remember like, yeah, I could fix it, but I can't get to it, right? They use their operations as a service for, for getting beyond that. Uh, they avoid the dog pile, like, oh, remember, I think there's a problem with this box over here, and then on the conference call, they log in, and they run top, and the first 10 things they see are 10 other of their colleagues running top, you know, on that box, <laughs> right? So they can use it as a way to share visibility into, you know, operational procedures, or the, eh, I don't read a wiki, I'm an expert, right? You know, but, oh, the service has changed, now they don't have this flag, go blow up, and, you know, if you don't pause the monitoring first, you wake everybody up, you know, and somebody comes along and says, oh, I've done this before, I'm not going to look at the wiki, and, you know, bad things happen, versus letting people just update these jobs, these self-service jobs, and then when people come along to run them at three o'clock in the morning, it's automatically updated, does what you're supposed to do. You know, finding uneven, uneven skills across the organization. I know how to do something, but somebody else, some other part of the organization, they're the one who knows how to do it. They can create a self-service job so anybody can, can do it. 
And uh, just the old, you know, I'm, I'll do this for you once and then again and again and again and again, right? Just be able to give them a, a job, a self-service job so you can work on other things. Lots of little uses like that where it builds and builds. And the idea being there, you cut down on all those interruptions and you cut down on the need for those ticket queues and all of the dangerous kind of ugly things that come with the ticket queues that we talked about earlier. So what about tickets, right? People think I'm, I hate tickets. I don't, but they're really good at two things. One is documenting true problems or issues or exceptions that actually uh, occurred. Remember the old trouble ticket? It's where it came from in the first place. And the second is routing for necessary approvals. There's a lot of uh, kind of regulatory things we have to do. Um, fascinating about this, we see a lot of folks using their operations as a service uh, you know, setup to actually automate the tickets. So they do an automated, they do a, they give somebody self-service restart, um, but behind the scenes, step one is creating a ticket, does all the restart, all the health checks, and then step like 12, it actually closes that ticket, nobody ever sees it, change management people are, are happy. But where tickets really get us in trouble is when they're used as a general purpose work management, traffic management system in an organization. That's all the bad things I was talking about earlier. And, so, and you go, well, uh, security compliance, they won't let us do the self-service thing. Um, and yes, they generally get a little concerned when you say you're going to let developers do things in, in production. But the reality is if you show them, they can build security and compliance into the platform, which actually gives them um, more comfort, right? Because all that evidence collection is... Uh, it happens automatically for audits. Uh, all of the compliance policies, security policies are written in code and can, and can be controlled from there. You aren't saying, here's an SSH key, here's uh, some pseudo privileges, here's a shell script, you know, say some prayers, have fun, right? You're actually you know, giving them a named command, go restart this, right? And, and they can uh, work from uh, that. So it's actually a way to raise your security and compliance posture while giving out control. Uh, seems kind of uh, orthogonal, but you can do it. So next thing is you know, shifting left uh, to take action, right? So push that ability to take uh, action in that direction. The operation service stuff comes in handy this as well too because not only is it a policy to say, hey, we need to empower these people with uh, the ability to take action, um, but we also need to give them the tooling and the enablement so you know, there's guardrails around what they're doing, right? So we're not giving them the inflicting trust as uh, Mark uh, uh, Rendell is out there, likes, likes to talk about. We aren't giving them too much, uh, you know, putting on them. We're giving them kind of a safer way to do things. And then reduce toil. You just got to track the toil limits. You set toil limits for each team. Uh, you got to fund the efforts to reduce those toil when those toil limits are blowing. Um, I think the rule of thumb in the industry now is like 50%, right? Toil and engineering work is the balance you want on a team. Uh, there's a lot of great lessons on this in the Google SRE books. Uh, there's one coming out that's not a Google SRE book, but also from O'Reilly called Seeking SRE that I actually wrote a chapter for. Uh, looks like it's going to be a really interesting book. Um, and so, okay, so recap. Number one, don't forget about uh, operations, right? Challenge that conventional wisdom. It's the only way they're really going to get the full value of these DevOps transformations is through, uh, um, through you know, taking it all the way through operations. Really take the time to understand these four forces, the silos, the ticket queues, the toil, the low trust, and figure out you know, kind of how do they affect your organization. Focus on removing the silos and the queues as much as possible. Um, you know, leveraging that kind of operations of service or self-service operations design pattern as much as possible, um, wherever you can't get rid of those, uh, those, those, um, those queues. Um, or I should say, wherever you, need, you think you need a queue, put the self-service in place instead. Uh, shift left that control and decision making. And then really learn from the SRE movement. I think there's a lot of really great things about toil, about air budgets. Um, and uh, it really talks about that shared responsibility and uh, that creates the capacity to change and it turns your operators from people who are constantly, the sky is falling and they're digging in that you know, digital salt mine into uh, using the full capacity of their experience and their uh, human ingenuity. So that's my talk. I'm Damon Edwards. Uh, I'm going to post the slides on Twitter. I saw you folks taking photos. And uh, we started to document a lot of this operations of service stuff. Um, on the Rundeck site, there's a whole like, kind of book you can read about it if you want to get more into it. It's rundeck.com slash OAS because we need more, more of those asses, right? And uh, <laughs> that's it. So uh, thank you very much for your time, and I'll be around. <laughs>